Man, 1990s church camp. Uh, who remembers 1990s church camp? Anyone go to church camp? Why did we go to church camp in the 90s? To meet the girls, amen. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't, but I did. Um, 1990s church camp. I was part of another church, uh, and we were going to a different church's camp. Went with a couple buddies, and we were nervous. We were a little timid, scared, right, because it was a new, new, whole new thing. We weren't sure. So I get on the bus. And as I'm sitting on the bus, we're kind of off to the side. There's this woman that gets on the bus. Um, I've had girlfriends, but this was a woman. She was my age, but this was a woman that was walking on red hair, freckles. You guys know who I'm talking about. My wife, Julie. She's walking on the bus. And I was like, oh, I was like, like, what do you do? So she says hi or something and walks by. And I, I was just an awestruck of this, this woman, and I said, there's no way this is ever going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm never going to land this girl. She's way out of my league. I'll try to catch a peek throughout the week, and that's all I'm going to get. So anyway, as the week went on, I started to notice that this girl was starting to hang around with me a little bit, that during, like, like we were eating dinner, she would come up, and she would sit by me, or in chapels, she would sit by me, or by the campfire, I was getting like the little Christian shoulder, shoulder massage, you know what I mean? I'm thinking, what is going on here? Something is wrong, but I, I, but I knew this was too good to be true. Some, something was messed up, but towards the end of the week, there we were playing capture the flag, and I saw out in the field under the moon and the stars, and she was lit up like an angel was Julie, and I looked over, and Julie's doing this. I'm like, who, who, me? So, of course, I walk over there all cool and slow. No, I ran like crazy, and I go over, and Julie gives me a big smudge, a big kiss, and I'm like, what is happening here? My mind is blown. I can't, I, I don't even, I can't believe it. I'm so awestruck that I look her right in the face and say, I love you, and she <laughs> She looks back and she goes, no, you don't. And I said, no, I don't. But I ended up, we ended up just falling in love and getting married. And it reminded me of the story of Matthew. That was a funny story. But where Matthew was called, and the title of our sermon today is, Who Me? Everyone say, Who Me? Me. Look at your neighbor and say, yes, you. That Jesus is calling you like Matthew. Matthew was one of the, he was the most unlikely person ever to be called to be an apostle for Jesus. He did not fit the office. You know what? And I still don't fit in with Julie, if you see us both. But God is, he didn't even laugh. God is calling you. He is calling you. And there, I got this clip from, uh, who watched the series, The Chosen? Has anyone seen that? So good, yeah. So I'm going to show you a clip. Matthew's the guy in the tax collector booth, and you'll see this in the clip, and this is a picture of Jesus calling him. So watch this. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy's done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to you. What are you doing? Where do you think you're going, guys? Let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. Yes. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. 
I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Amen. Man, if that does encourage you, right? Um, I, I love that picture of Matthew being called, and it's absolutely just incredible. It makes me cry every time. I've watched it like a thousand times, so I'm starting to calm down a little bit. But I love that picture when Matthew's being called, and I love actually where it's placed in the Gospels. If you actually look at the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see that it's placed in after many different miracles. You see that Jesus healed the paralytic. Pastor Brent talked about that last week. Healed the person with leprosy. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. That's probably the biggest miracle ever. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm not sure what Peter was hoping for when he called Jesus over. He's like, hey, it's, it's too late. No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> love you. Uh, but he, he did that. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He cast out demons, right? He did all these miracles. And then Matthew tells his story and he called me. It's like he was saying, Jesus can heal all that, but he can't heal me. He can heal the leopard, he can heal the, the demon possessed, he can heal Peter's mother-in-law, but he can't heal me. It's too late. And see, being a tax collector, collector was a very hated person. And Matthew, actually in this booth, when you took this office of tax collector, this became who you were. This is pretty much the most hated person around. He was in the same class as like the rapist, as the murderers. He was the lowest of the low. Matthew was a man that everyone hated. See, tax collectors in those days were very wealthy. It was like owning a Fortune 500 company that you got everything you wanted. See, the, the Rome would set the, the tax bracket or the tax amount and everything you collected after that, you got to keep. So it was full of deceit and dishonesty. You would rip off his family. His members, you started paying taxes when you were around 12 years old as a Jew. So you hated them your whole life. You know, like imagine a young person, I started taking your allowance right away. You had to tax it right away. Like there was, there was a hatred that started at a young age right through. They were considered unclean like animals. They weren't allowed in the synagogues. They weren't allowed in the temples. They weren't allowed to go to dinner with any Jew. The Jews would not associate with these people. To take this job, you actually committed yourself to total selfishness, that this was all about the things of the world and all about what I could receive from being in this booth. Became their safe place. It became everything that he really knew. So the tax collector booth was a place of very misfortune. And when Jesus calls him out of this, it's probably the biggest invitation that we see and, and the greatest examples of Jesus's power to actually call somebody out of this, to see the person for who they are, but not who they are in that moment, to actually remove them from a situation and to call them into more. So the truth is, Matthew accepted that invitation, and when he accepted that invitation, he left that tax booth forever. He moved on. The invitation for Matthew to follow Jesus was a power that we see that Jesus, that, that he could call anybody regardless of where you are regardless of what you've done. And in reality, we all have a booth, don't we? We all have a booth. We all have something that we cling to, a past that we get stuck to. And I don't know what your booth is, but I have a feeling that you probably already know what it is. Sometimes it's a secret sin and you're scared to death someone's gonna find out. Like sexual sins, man, we tend to hide those. Pornography, oh no. You know, it's just something I do alone. It's demonic. You know, Montreal is the number one producer of pornography in North America, pretty much in the world, and you're trying to tell me something that close doesn't portray a demonic presence? <laughs> Leaving this booth is not easy. Sometimes it's our identity. Sometimes we've lived in that booth our whole life. For me, I've tried to preach from that booth. Not tried, I have. 
tried to raise my kids from this booth, tried to be a good husband from this booth, and it was empty. The guy asked, why, why would you want to leave the booth? Because the booth represents, separate, like it separates you from Christ. Like the picture of that is everything that Jesus wasn't. That, that is the picture, and he's calling us out of that. I've tried to live there, and I know many of you, like a lot of us have, like whether it's insecurity, whether it's money, you might not even recognize what it is because we're so blind to it. It's the absence of Christ. Like Matthew, God knows you, he knows your name, and he knows your heart, and he knows exactly where you're at. He knows all about you. He knows your intent, he knows your needs, he knows your mind, and he knows your need for forgiveness, and that it only comes from Jesus. I have a story of a young man that attempted suicide, and he slit his wrist, and he was in the hospital, and it didn't look like he was going to make it. And the plastic surgeons come in, and they, they, re, like, they put all the tendons back together, did surgery on the veins, the nerves, and it was a very long procedure. And the next day, the young boy woke up, and he was awake, and the doctor went in to see him, and he said, hey, we fixed your wrist. We, we healed them up, and the boy began to, to cry. And he says, why, why are you crying? He says, well, you fixed my wrist, but who's going to fix my life? And isn't that the truth? That we're wondering all the time, like when we go through these situations, when we're living in the booth, and this is a reality. This, this is a real thing, and our world's probably in, there's more of this going on maybe than it ever has. And it's like, who's going to fix our life? And I'm here to tell you, when you leave the booth, that guy's Jesus. And yeah, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus, follow Jesus. What does that practically look like? And I really, really, really believe, and this is where it changed for me, when I really believed what I gained by following Christ, we won't go back to the booth. See, if you really don't believe who you become and what you receive, we'll end up back there every time. Every time. I, I, the cool thing is, is that's me. I, I, I live this, so I'm an example of that, that when Christ wasn't everything for me, when I really didn't believe what I became, I went back every time. It would scratch that itch. It would cover that sin. I could hide there, and Jesus is calling you out of that booth today. And again, I don't know what it is for you. So how do I become a follower of Jesus? You say yes. That's it. Christ is calling you out of your past into a future which is way better because we're with him, and you just say yes. So what do I have to gain by receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, by following Jesus. It says in Matthew 9.9, 9, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in his tax collector booth. Follow me and be my disciple. Again, being a disciple, you can't be a Christian without being a disciple, and you can't be a disciple without being a Christian. You're either a Jesus follower or not a believer. So Jesus said to him, Matthew, get up. And he followed. So Matthew got up and followed him. So what do I gain by following Jesus? The first thing we gain, and we see Matthew gains it instantly, is healing. Right away. And, and the reason I know this and we know this is because we never see where Matthew went back to this. Matthew believed he was a new creation. He was made whole and he had no need for this anymore. That he left that and he followed Jesus. Actually, in different, different versions, it says, so Matthew arose and follow Jesus, which is a picture of resurrection, that it was a new beginning. He was a new creation. You know, this was about forgiving sins and following Jesus. We see, like, the miracle in Matthew following Jesus is about forgiving sins. We see Pastor Brent preach last week on healing the paralytic, and the paralytic got healed, and he got up and walked. The big miracle there was what? That Jesus forgave his sins. The getting up and walking was the bonus Jesus wants to forgive you of your past and call you out of this and to call you to something new. But we need to believe we're healed. We need to believe that the past is gone forever and we're a new creation. It says in Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Another version says completely well. See, the true reason that Adam stayed in this booth and the true reason that you stay here in your brokenness is because of self-will and choices. Jesus is available for you to follow him today and now. And when you make that yes and say that yes, you get complete 
healing. In Luke, Jesus went on to say to them, if anyone follows me, he must say no to the things of the past. He must say no to the things he wants. And every day he must be willing even to die on the cross and follow me. We need to say yes to him and no to that. We need to say yes to the things that scratch that itch. We need to say yes to the things that Jesus is asking us to do and no to those. We need to believe that Jesus has healed us. We need to believe that we follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob was a scoundrel. We need to hold on to that, that God. We need to wrestle with him until he blesses us. We never let go of following Jesus. The best example I can ever think of that I saw, one of the best was, I don't know if you guys know my story, some of you would, but I was an addict for years. And I showed up in a rehab when, in my mid-20s. And when I showed up there, I was this Baptist guy in a church, and, and I thought I had it kind of all together other than I was an addict. I was messed up in my mind. And I said, if I could get rid of, get rid of the drug, then I'll be okay. If I could actually just get rid of this and follow Jesus, then, then, then I'll be okay. If I could just get rid of that. But I didn't really believe I was healed. And I had a friend, and his name was Gary. And Gary was absolutely amazing. He had a body shape just like a penguin. I, I can picture it. <laughs> He was absolutely one of my best buds. And when I met Gary, I realized that I didn't have it so bad. You know, Gary had lost uh, family members, brothers. Gary had lost really everything, including his teeth, his looks. He was beaten down and beaten up. And I remember we were sitting in a worship service, and I was kind of mentoring Gary, I thought. And we sit there. And uh, we, we have a prayer time before, and Gary starts to pray, and there was more profanity in his prayer than I'd ever heard, but it was so real. Gary knew that he was a sinner being called. And the worship started, and Gary's just vibrating. I see Gary standing beside me, and he's just vibrating. And again, I hadn't been in this, this setting or this experience, and, and all of a sudden, we're singing Everlasting God, an older song, and Gary looks over at me and says, I just want to run around. And I'm like, I don't know, Gary, run around then. And Gary in his penguin-shaped body tore the place up like crazy. And he's running and he's doing laps. And I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And what I experienced in that moment is Gary believed he was healed and I didn't. Gary believed that Jesus came into his life and removed everything from him. And all he had left was Jesus. And all he wanted to do was follow him. And Gary, in that moment, I seen the belief in his heart and in his eyes and in him running around. There was the joy of the Lord. You know what Gary believed in? He saw the glory of God and the majesty of the Holy Spirit coming over him and in him. And he didn't care about anything else other than following and running after Christ. And I cared about me, my choices, and self-will. So we need to really believe that we're healed if we're going to follow Jesus. We need to believe that the healing is, is taken place and completed on the cross, and we follow him. The next thing we gain is hunger. We gain hunger. We see later Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. We see that Matthew leaves the booth, he believes he's healed, and now he's sitting at the table with Jesus. He is sitting at the table with Jesus. He's having a dinner party with the Lord, with God Almighty. He's sitting there enjoying. His hunger had now changed. What used to satisfy doesn't anymore. And he's sitting there eating. And this is a picture this is a picture of sitting at the table. This isn't something that, that they just did in the Old Testament where you could just eat with anybody. This was like a holy thing. This was a picture of deep, deep friendship and communion. Think of Moses with the elders of Israel in, in communion under the covenant with the Lord. They're eating. You think in Isaiah it says, go buy food with no money. That's what will satisfy. What God is saying is it's free. Why are you spending money on something that won't satisfy his hunger changed. Something changed. Jesus has prepared a table for you and he wants to sit with you. Other versions say Jesus was sitting and he was reclining at the table. He was actually sitting there enjoying them. You know, you're not a burden to Jesus. He wants to enjoy you. 
Because of your problems and your mistakes, as you come to him and eat at his table, you're not a burden. He wants to enjoy you. He wants to sit with you. You know, there's two things that we need to see. But first, you know, the table is a picture. It's a place where broken sinners find connection and belonging. It's a place where we can go and feel accepted. We can talk to to God and have him remove our, like we say at CR, our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. You need to get this. Number one, God is inviting you into a relationship. And he wants you to get to know him. God is inviting you into new relationship. He's inviting you out of your past into new relationship. Number two is that you would let other people know about the first. God is inviting you into new relationship and he wants you to tell others. I love how Matthew couldn't wait to invite new people to the table. Matthew didn't go alone. He had all his friends, his tax collectors. All these people are sitting there because he wanted them to experience what he received. You know, I've never been so filled up when I've seen a friend or a loved one come and sit at the table with me, ever. I've never seen, like, I've never seen somebody come so alive and not me be filled up. You know, are you comfortable sitting at the table, the same table? Are you comfortable with the people Jesus is comfortable to sit with? You know, what does it look like to eat at his table? Like, well, what are some practical ways? Like yesterday morning, I was in here preparing and the chair team's here and they're setting up. That, that, that's eating at his table. That's going to fill it up. My, my friend that built this tax booth is playing worship music. He loved, loved doing it. He went so overboard and it was so awesome. And he just loved to do it. That's eating at the table, spending time in the presence of the Lord. Whether it's serving at Alpha and our kids ministry or going and feeding the poor, being with people that Jesus loves like you. Because we're all the same, and God has called us all. Jesus was comfortable with the worst, are we? Are you eating at the booth and living there or eating at the table? What are you hungry for? What are you eating? You know, in Jeremiah, it says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and a delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. In John 6, it says, Jesus replied, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It says in 1 Peter 2, so get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy. Be done with this. Be done with the past. Be done with your own feelings, your own selfish, your own selfish thoughts, fulfilling the flesh. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into the full experience of salvation. We need to cry out for this nourishment now that you have a taste of the Lord's kindness. You know, once you've tasted God and once you've dined with him and once you've sat at his table, you won't go back. And once you believe that you are healed, we don't go back. There's a new hunger in us that can only be satisfied by him. The last one is, is we gain health. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not other sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. You know, Jesus came to call who? The sick. He came to call us. He invited us at the table. And if he's calling the sick, what does he want to do to us? He wants to heal us. Have you ever been around someone that's a person of faith? Like I I use my brother, Pastor Dan. Like when you're around somebody healthy, it's just different. There's something that's just they're not carrying. They're more concerned about the presence of the Lord than the things of the world. They're more concerned with being in communion with God than all the other things. They don't care about the gossip and all the stuff that's going on and the insecurities and people saying this and people saying that. They're more concerned with being in the presence of the Lord. And as we follow Christ, we start to get healthy. As we eat this food, it it brings health to our body, nourishment to our soul. And the way we think starts to change. And as we follow Christ and make healthy choices... 
life starts to look different and we do start to get healthy. I'm here just to, to, to prophesy and believe with you that like when you follow Christ, those things that you're struggling with will fall off you. It's not a matter of like, like maybe or this. No, they will. They will. The anxiety and stuff that we prayed about earlier when we prayed, like you need to believe that healing has happened. It, it is done. If Jesus says it's finished, it's finished. I love being around healthy people because they, they understand and they're, they're in the glory of the Lord. They want what God has other than what this used to offer. They understand that their healing and their hunger can only be satisfied through him. We all know the state of the world and we all know that it's hurting and it's, it's in a tough place. That, man, things like our young people. Like when I was young, I didn't even know what anxiety meant or the word. I had no idea, but I know the same God that was there reigns today and that God wants to come in and heal our families and heal our schools and heal our, our like offices and our workplace. He wants to clean the streets up. He wants to get rid of addiction and it comes to submitting to him. See, when you're healthy, when you're hungry and you know you're healed, when you get in a tough spot, when you get in a place of despair or a place where you don't know you're gonna make it, you will make it. Because you go before the Lord instead of back to the thing you used to go back to. For me, this happened in, in May or June where I, I was just in a spot, I guess. Like I said, I'm really familiar with the booth. Uh, more familiar than most of you guys probably. Sometimes it's very comfortable and sometimes I'm very tempted to go back. But because I've been eating at this table, I have no desire for that. I make mistakes, but I'm, I'm there. I might touch it but I'm not going in it. And I believe I'm healed and I was, I was driving and I was struggling and I just, honestly, I was going to the west side and my family over there, I, I just love it and, and you know what, I didn't wanna go. I just, it felt like work and I was just like, I, I just don't wanna do this anymore. Like, am I too young to retire? I'm like, what can I? And I was just in a spot, seriously. And you know, it was scary for me because it's just, I always went to the worst spot, man. Like, I didn't just, like, I don't know, man. I just didn't do like that. I was, I went to the lowest of the lows and destroyed everything around me. So when I get in a spot, I get a little scared and I get a little nervous. It's like I've screwed up so many times. What am I going to do now? But because I believed with all my heart, like my friend Gary, that that is not who I am, that God has called me out of that, and I have been feasting at his table for almost 10 years. And you know what? Because I've been feasting there, there's strength and there's wisdom and there's health because I'm not doing it on my own anymore. I'm doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of friends. So as I'm driving there, I just was praying and contending because I knew I wasn't going to quit. And in that moment, the Lord showed up. He showed up so powerfully, I had to pull over. And he wrapped his arms around me. And he knows I'm silly. <laughs> and he knows, he knows you. He knows how to get to you. He knows how to comfort you. And as he wrapped his arms around me, he sang me a nursery rhyme. And he did. I'm not going to sing it. But it was head, head and shoulders, knees and toes is what he spoke over me. Yeah! And, uh, and in that moment, I felt the glory just fall. And, it, and he just said, your mind is mine and it's been transformed. Don't think about what you can't control. Follow me. The weight that you've put on your shoulders, not me, the weight that you're carrying, you were never intended to carry. I've got you, Adam. I've given you fresh legs, new knees and new feet to follow me like Matthew, to follow that call. I didn't have to live here. I didn't have to go back. And that came from a, a new hunger. It came from a place believing that I was healed, that I didn't have to go back to the things that I thought used to satisfy and the Lord touched me in that moment, you know. I made it to church. And in that time, there was a work that the Lord was doing in me. I, can, I just, I need to tell you, don't give up. Like seriously, well, I haven't felt the Holy Spirit in a while, right? Don't give up. Pursue him. Pursue him. He will show up. My, my most powerful touch from the Holy Spirit, like, like you want to talk about the most powerful touch I got from the Holy Spirit was 20 years after the journey of addiction, after the journey of following him, after the journey of preaching and teaching and helping other addicts. And finally, 
There's a touch, and you know what? He'll touch me again, and he'll touch you, so do not give up. So I don't know what your booth is. I don't know what it is today, but I know we have them. It could be addiction. It could be despair. It could be insecurities. It could be your marriage. It could be lying. It could be pornography. It could be lust. I don't know what it is. And maybe you're not in the booth. Maybe you're on the outside, but you're working your way back. I'm here to encourage you today to listen to the Father. Because like Matthew, a person that wasn't worthy, the least of the least, he called him. And he called him out of his past. And he called him into a new life. And we see that Matthew did what? He never went back. He followed Jesus for the rest of his life. And keep reading. It doesn't get easier. But there's something different. He was being fed by something that will satisfy him. He's being fed by the God Almighty who created the universe, that created you for his pleasure. So again, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're in a really good spot and you're feeling this. Well, guess what? He's calling you to more. And that's a good thing. The Holy Spirit isn't done with you and he wants his fire to fall on you. And maybe you're like, man, I've been doing good. Amen. Then you know what? Invite some other people to the table with you. Don't eat there alone. And maybe, like I used to be, you're in this booth and you feel trapped. I'm here to tell you there's no shame around the cross. And there's no guilt. It was finished. I'm going to have you stand. And I just want to pray, really, just a prayer of blessing over you. I, I, I know God is doing work in hearts and souls here. And I just want to, I just want to pray really courage and focus. That you just, you just focus on him for a season. Even take this week and say, God, where are you calling me? What are you calling me out of? What steps do I need to make? to make this last. That the healing, that believing who you really are and who you've created to be, who he created you to be is real. So I'm gonna pray over you. Holy Spirit, we praise you. We know it says, for I have come not to call those who think they are righteous, but to call those who know they are sinners. He is calling your name, who me? Yes, me. He is calling us. So, Father, would you, would you give us just wisdom in the choices that we need to make as we leave the past behind? Father, Holy Spirit, would you fall on us and give us strength as we follow you? God, would you, again, just pour your mercy and your, your grace upon us as a church as we move forward? God, would you give us just names of those that we need to invite to the table with us? God, lives that you want to change and you want to touch and you want to use us to reach them. So, Father, we thank you and we bless you today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.